Welcome to Hague's Business Winners, a club that brings together leaders, industry experts, entrepreneurs, startups, and those willing to share their business experiences and learn from others. Just like my podcast, Other Side of the Business Card, we explore business conversations with humanity, humor, and passion. Listen in as we uplift, motivate, and learn from each other. Welcome, everybody, to Hague's Business Winners. My name is Hague Armaganian, and I'm a strategic advisor, a CEO, and a podcaster. On Hague's Business Winners, we bring together leaders, industry experts, and entrepreneurs to share their business experiences and insights. And today is a special day because Mike and I go back over 25 years, so really excited that I'm joined by a fantastic guest. He is founder, dean, and former vice president of the University of Toyota, Mike Morrison. Mike has an impressive background in lean thinking, and has consulted a range of organizations, including Nike, Harley-Davidson, Avery Dennison, and Gallup. As an author, speaker, and consultant, he brings his leadership development expertise through his founding company, The Leadership Workshop, and is dedicated to helping leaders and organizations create meaningful change, something that we, uh, we both believe in, Mike. Mike has also written multiple books around leadership, with his newest one, Creating Meaningful Change, the heart of leadership to be released later this year, and I'm looking forward to uh, to talking to you, Mike, about the book writing because I've got two books in in progress. So I'm, I'm kind of interested to know how you started off, and then because I remember when you were doing your first book, that was 25 years ago, I think, and then um, how that's kind of uh, grown into to something that you do on, on more of a continuum. Today we'll be discussing leadership and creating meaningful change. We'll also dive into topics such as employee engagement, an area that Mike is very passionate about. So without further ado, Mike, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you. My first question is kind of, when did this um, this kind of leadership, this love of leadership start? Again, when I knew you at University of Toyota, you, you were really big into the lean thinking and a lot of Japanese philosophies and um as you know we started off without necessarily the, the, the strong leadership focus obviously your division was kind of big into that but i'm interested to know uh from when you were at school to to degree university again was this at your core or was this something that grew out of what you saw as a need for people to to be better leaders or understand uh leadership kind of qualities better that's that's yeah that's a great question if you you know if you think about it uh, change is inevitable you know we we see that around us but but meaningful change isn't so uh, early on i got inspired by this notion of you know how, how how can we frame things so that we just don't frame them for success or or for completion or getting them off our plate but how can we put meaning, which seems like a big concept, right? How do we put that at the center, at the center of our change? So that's that's kind of been my journey for the last 25 years. Where this n- new book came from is it's kind of born out of the pandemic. If if you think about it, there were probably two two views, two popular views for the for the pandemic. One was uh, let's get through this storm. And then we'll get back to our old normal. We'll, we'll, we'll survive this and we'll go back to our old normal. And there were others who saw it really as more than surviving a storm, but really saw a new weather pattern, right? A larger weather, weather pattern starting to emerge and, and saw some potential opportunity. Some, certainly some risk, but some potential opportunity. And as we've now seen uh, over the last couple of years, meaningful change really has evolved. We will probably never think about work in the same way ever again, and certainly a lot of other things, and certainly for the better. So this last two years represents kind of, I think, this, this uh, uh, it's ushered in a new era where, where uh, meaning, I think, will be more at the center of what we're looking for. Uh, we've all seen the great resignation where a lot of people left, not just because of the lack of respect and pay and things like that, but a lot of people left because um, there just wasn't uh, the, the kind of meaning that they were looking for in terms of, uh, in terms of their life. No, I love that. And, um, but, but a word like, I guess, meaningful, um, 
you know, how do you define that? And do you find when you talk to groups of people, as I know you often do, that yes. um, they have the same understanding of meaningful? Because I think, because I guess that's also a Gen Y thing, right? The, the whole meaningful, full, um, I guess, is related to purpose. And, and you know, I'm a Gen X, so it wasn't, uh, you know, the top of the the top of your list then when I started school it was about having a good job and and just kind of you know learning and surviving and you were grateful for that it wasn't so much what is the purpose of my life right and, th and things have kind of shifted a little so so maybe just expand a little bit on the meaning of meaningful sure that's it that's another great question and and uh, we'll start by you know just saying that when when meaning is present when, when in our lives that all kinds of good things happen in terms of our well-being uh, our productivity, our, you know, engagement, all kinds of good things happen when there's a sense of meaning. So the, the, the question, so, so what is it? And it really uh, uh, boils down to about three things. So, and it's a great place to start, as you say, you know, meaning can seem like this broad concept. Um, but if you think about it, when, when there's a strategy change or some kind of change in organization, you know, the first thing we want to know is, well, what's the meaning of this? What's the meaning of this? And that can be answered in t usually three fundamental ways. And the, and the first one is why. You know, why are we making this strategic change? And, and is it purposeful? Does it make sense beyond just, you know, trying something new in the market? Is this aligned to who we are? So the first thing is answering the why question. Is it, is it purposeful? You know, will it get us out of bed you know, uh, earlier. And then the second question it, around meaning is, is beyond purposeful. What is it? You know, help me make sense out of this. So in the second case, meaning is about sense making. It's about really understanding the elements of this strategy. And that's when we get that aha moment where we might go, oh, I get it. I get it. That makes total sense. So uh, purpose sense. And the third thing we always want to know is, well, what does this mean to me? And each person has to answer that question individually, right? It's So the, the great leader is one who not only uh, answers the why question and then answers the what question, but really lets everybody else involved start to answer the, the how question. How are we going to really achieve this? It sounds exciting. It makes sense to me. But how are we going to achieve it? And if you think about some of the great errors in, in leadership, it's often not really being real clear about why we're doing it, uh, what it actually is. You know, most people in organizations, some 70 percent are unclear on what the strategies are. And then the, the participation or involvement where we get to make make sense out of it for ourselves, make it part of what what we're going to do. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to just jump back to when. Um Again, when you were maybe starting out at uh, Toyota, I don't know how many years that was, but uh, 30 years ago, um, do you believe that you had um, some of these answers? You went through the, the kind of three definitions, well, the three areas of meaningful to you. Do you think that we, or even myself, do you think we, we asked ourselves these questions and had those answers, or do you think this is something that's come through the last 10, 15 years where people have the luxury to to kind of really think about purpose? Yeah, well, yeah, it's the, the need has always been there, but in our go-go world, right, to under pressure, uh, sometimes uh, uh, it's it's hard to slow down and fully answer those questions. You know, we're a lot of our, uh, uh, you know, how we're perceived. It's based on our results and our action. So again, most of us have kind of the opposite experience where. Uh, and even more so today, we, we have the opposite of experience of feeling like maybe we're reacting, overreacting, not, like, not fully thinking things through. Um, and so those three questions, what, why, what, and how, don't get fully answered. And that's where a lot of the anxiety uh, occurs, occurs in organizations. If you think about it, uh, uh, it, it hasn't gotten any easier. The, these last two decades have been incredible incredibly challenging you know it's not just the increasing global competition but look at all the events that have occurred that have just been so disruptive from the global financial crisis in 2008 a series of recessions 
And now we're in a period, right, a post-pandemic period that's both recessionary and inflationary. Um, uh, you know, we have supply chain interruptions. We have higher fuel costs. And we're not unified in any way, in any way, towards some of our bigger problems we share, like, you know, the, the, the climate challenge. So it's, it's meaning has the potential to be even more elusive today just because of, of the, the pace of change and the complexity of these challenges on our plate. But it's always been there. It's, it's the leadership thing that says, no, 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 we're going we're gonna to figure this out. We're going to do this in a meaningful way, right? We're going to you know, align this to our purpose. We're going to make it significant to us. We're going to involve people in different ways. So, uh, you know, it's the, yeah. it's, it, it, without leadership, right? Without leadership, it's easy for us to default to some of our reactive tendencies. So I'm picking up from this, uh, this conversation. Thank you. Thank you for answering that question that, that there was a big impact, I guess, from, um, from the last two years in terms of how, how people have changed. Um, and I'm not talking about just the great resignation, but I think you're also saying, you know, the style of leaderships, um, that we're seeing now is, is, is out of, out of that. Um, and I was just wondering, a lot of the stuff that I did in, in leadership was, um, you know, based on Werner Erhardt, and they talk a lot about a crucible, exper- you know, a crucible experience or events, you know, like like very traumatic events also help shift people into a more conscious state. Now, do you think that uh, that that is necessary for for people to become leaders and 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 make real change? Or, or do you think it can be done in a linear fashion of just kind of learning and observing what's around you? Yeah, our, our common experience, it does, it often does take a burning platform. It takes, uh, uh, you know, a larger challenge to, to uh, yeah, get us out of our uh, comfort zone or get us out of our equilibrium. Um, so, yeah, I do, I do believe sometimes it's, you know, we're not necessarily led by vision, which is wonderful, um, but we're often led by this urgency, uh, you know, to, to, to rethink things and to, and to align them. And again, if you look at the pandemic, it's pretty amazing. Again, we saw some, some failure, obviously, and we saw some people not adapt well or some organizations not, but we saw others just almost immediately, uh, you know, after getting a sense of what's really going on, getting over the shock of, of what is this and, and how could we respond, really start to do some incredible things, bringing their, you know, working at home, like shifting a workforce overnight to, to working at home, being connected. Yeah, it was tough initially, but pretty soon we even started to see, you know, the social aspects, the, the Zoom cocktail hours, uh, pe- People uh, brought humor into what was a, a pretty dark, dark situation. Uh, so there was great adaptation. And I think that sometimes I always tell leaders in the absence of a crisis, invent one or create a sense of urgency that gets us uh, thinking differently like we did in the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, in, in terms of some of your previous works of art, your books that you've written, do you want to talk a little about those and what made you get into that? Because I'm at the moment fighting over my first first book and what the topic should be. And I'm just interested to know when when we, when we you started out, I guess, what drove you into the first title? Was that a success for you or was that something that, you know, five, ten years later, you're like, well, you know, if, even if I hadn't done that, I would have rather started with book number two. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I, I think you talk to anyone, everyone has a book within them. You know, I'm in Los Angeles, so it's either a book or a screenplay. But everybody, talk about the need for meaning. Everybody has a book within them and talk to anyone in, you know, in a coffee shop and they usually have something in the back of their mind, Some, something about uh, uh, their narrative, their story that they, they want to tell. And so for me, when I was at Toyota, I, I saw uh, this need for, for what I would frame as personal leadership, this need for, for being more authentic in the workplace. Great pressures to conform to, 
you know, fit a model, fit a mode. And I definitely experienced that at, at Toyota. It's, it's in every organization. So, so my first book was really about the other side of the card. You know, on your business card, it's, it gives all your contact information. But on your other side of your business card, how do I connect with you? You know, so the book was meant to be a, 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 a little bit of a parable, a story about there's two sides of the business card. And uh, on the other side, the blank side, it tends to be our authentic self. How do we bring that, that side into play? So I wrote kind of a fictional story. It's kind of like a, you know, who moved my cheese, very short book, just to get people to start thinking differently about, you know, what side of their car do they operate on? That's really interesting, uh, given that my um, uh, my second podcast series was called Other Side of the Business Card, and um, I'm just getting ready to uh, to start bringing the guests on for the third season, so uh, I, I should maybe read that book of yours. Yes, you should. <laughs> I, li- I like the concept of your authentic self. I think that's, uh, that is fantastic. Um, in terms of uh, your book itself, I'd, I'd love to give some of the listeners here some, some of the, the main concepts you've got in there. So I think relationship building strategies is one. You know, rethinking employee, employee engagement practices is one. Um, do you want to pick one of those and just expand a little bit about what we will get when we kind of look through your book in terms of uh, achieving meaningful change? The, the hope here with this book is it kind of returns us to the, to the simplicity of what leadership really is. And, and, and it's just based on three self-defining concepts that we, we always do anyway. So it's kind of leveraging who we are and the, 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 the idea that, that creating meaningful change is, is first, it's, it's the, it's creating the from to, it's spending the necessary time to really define current reality, not just gloss over it or, or pretend it didn't happen, but really define current reality, really get clear on what's, what's going on to motivate us to do something different. And then spending the necessary time on the two, where, where is it that we do want to go? And we're always doing that kind of wayfinding. You know, we're always looking for the next job, the next deal, kind of dreaming about some some potential future. But unless you have that clarity in your wayfinding, right, finding our way about the from and the to, um, we often don't make the kind of movement we we need to do. So uh, the the book aligns just to the three elements of, of, of meaning making, right. You know, from clarifying our wayfinding, the direction, the purpose of what we're doing. And then, and then once we launch our journey, whether it's a small personal one or a larger, uh, more, you know, significant strategic change in our organization, we have to do the learning and sense making, uh, to really make this happen. It's not a project to be implemented, um, it's going to take some uh, uh, some experimenting, some new thinking, some different types of engagement to get there. Uh, that's why we see these huge failure rates with change. You know, the the number that's always thrown around is seventy percent. Well, from most people's experience, it's actually higher than that. And 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 then the the third part, as I've noted, is it's you know the failure to really involve people at an individual level the 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 because change never really fully happens never gets embedded until we change until we change personally so uh, when change is something someone else does and it's something that's not quite fully you know envisioned uh, if there isn't the kind of learning that goes along with it um, and the kind of participation it just simply fails so we, we try to just make it that simple instead of some eight step model or, you know, something that's formulaic. It really tries to show just these three basic core elements that we do anyway. When we get up every morning, we're trying to find our way. When we get up every morning, we're trying to make sense out of things. And when we get up every morning, we're trying to, you know, find something important to us, significant to us that can be that we can be a part of. And effective leadership does that, does that consistently, right, for, for teams within organizations. 
Yeah, no, I, I love that. Um, and in terms of, the, you know, you, you've come out with a lot of what seems like evidence-based uh, research or, or facts. I was going to say, so so how have you sourced the the kind of evidence or the information to, to kind of build your model and, and build your concept? And uh, how long did that take you? Yeah, you know, a decade. Uh, you know, this involves about a, a thousand d- different managers uh, going through a process as we tr- try to learn more about the process. It's often started with a simple question. It'd be, you know, it'd be like, hey, what is the meaningful change you're trying you're trying to create right now? And you'd have an answer. You'd have an answer. But the word that would kind of get your attention is meaningful. You know, you could be thinking, yeah, there's a lot of change I'm I'm kind of involved with. I'm trying to install this software or, you know, come up with a new sound system, whatever. But when I throw in the word meaningful, it would give you a little you know, a little bit of, of pause in terms of how you and how you might answer. But uh, to, to be honest, the, you know, with a thousand people kind of going through a leadership development process and getting experience with them, we learned our way through, uh, through others. And uh, at the beginning of, of my efforts to help develop leaders, I don't think I knew what I was doing. <laughs> it was, uh, right. uh, and, then, and then it quickly transitioned to not knowing what I was doing, but at a very sophisticated level. Um, so it sounded like I knew, knew what I was doing, but it, it took a long time and a lot of help and, uh, from other journeyers to really get to the essence of what it means to lead and then to, to uh, you know, provide these simple frameworks uh, to allow people to start their own, their own change initiatives. But the reality is change is every day, whether we want to have a better meetings, um, uh, meaningful change is something and the, and the simple, the simple frameworks that support it is something that is, becomes part of our everydayness. It's not about some project or something big and strategic. It can be, but it's more about how we kind of start to live through the change that surrounds us in our lives. Brilliant. Um, and, uh, we're gonna. We're halfway through, and I wanted to just thank Mike again. I just realized you're in Los Angeles, and it's very early, so you're probably in your gym jams. Um, so thank you for getting up so early. Um, so we got Mike Morrison, PhD here, founder and president of the Leadership Workshop. Um, Mike and I worked together over 25 years ago at uh, at Toyota in the Toyota University. So it's great to reconnect with you. I think last time I saw you was in uh, in uh, Long Island, was it with Ara? I think yeah. it was about yeah, four absolutely. years ago. And yeah. that and that was a lovely uh, a lovely evening. Um, yeah. So thanks for joining. I'm going to ask. Uh, like I said, we're halfway through, and I'm now going to open up in the second half. This is when it gets exciting. Is I'm going to open up to um, uh, my distinguished stage here or panel to uh, ask some questions too. So while Abigail, if I can ask you to reset the room, I will ask um, uh, any of the people on stage to um, to flash their mics if they have a question. So um, over to you, Abigail. Hello and welcome to Haig's Business Winners. Whether you've just joined us or you've been here from the beginning, Haig brings together guests to have conversations about what it is that um, has gone on for them on their journey. And today we are joined by Mike Morrison. He is the fantastic founder, Dean, former vice president of the University of Toyota and Any questions that you've got now is your opportunity to ask them. If you're joining us and you can't join, maybe you're on audio, uh, you're not able to speak, then put them in the chat and we will get to those questions right now. So, Haig, back to you. Okay, uh, that's great. Thank you, Abigail. And and again, um, Mike, we're going to see who in the uh, on stage here has any questions. And any of you in the audience who've got questions, you can put your hand up. Hand raising should be on, um, and we'll just check that. But uh, so um, let's start with um, with the people in on stage here. Um, Abigail, I guess you you were on anyway. Why don't we start with you, ladies first? Amazing. Well, I'm absolutely loving this conversation. First of all, I just want to say thank you so much, Mike, for sharing your wisdom and knowledge. Um, Can't wait to take a further look at your books. Um, So my question is really 
diving into the actual what you do. So let's imagine for a second that your clients had their wake up call, whether that was in 2008 or it was in the in-between time or perhaps in 2020, they found um, that they were at their rock bottom. What advice do you actually give them at the start of their journey? So obviously you've got the tools to help them along the journey, but what advice are you giving them at the very, very start? Because we know change is simple, but it's not easy. So they're in the middle of perhaps breaking down and life doesn't look how it looked before. Um, They've got teams, they've got families, they've got people, they've got dependencies that need them. So what advice are you giving them to be able to keep going um, from a BAU point of view? Yeah, very, yeah, great, great, great question. And it, it really gets to the, to the, <coughs> the, the heart of leadership and what we call it the heart of leadership. You know, it's that empathic response. Uh, when people are under that kind of pressure, they feel like, gosh, you know, is, are we, is our company going to survive this? Will we be able to right the ship here. And as we know, a lot, a lot didn't make it, particularly, you know, in hospitality during the pandemic, you know, within the first year, I think there's something like a hundred thousand restaurants that would never reopen as, as a result. So the, the, in, in terms of organizations though, that, that we're at that point, you know, at that critical point where they're having to rethink their, their future, what is that, that starts with that, that settling in, that pausing, not overreacting. Uh, reacting is not a good choice, right? Overreacting is not a very good choice. So again, we the idea is to bookend it, and 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 those two elements go on almost simultaneously. It's really coming to grips with the current reality. Do do we have the right strategies in place? The right people, you know. It's it's some hard discussions that that really anchor one end that that get a sense, but we don't spend all the time there, right? We kind of go back and forth with our, our two state, the vision of what we want to create. Um, so simultaneously, we're getting absolute clarity on where we're at and then where, where we want to go, what might be the right, the right re- response. So that gets articulated, right? And the critical thing, right, is those, those early wins. And so we always start with this sense of progress. Uh, what might be that first step that would signal t- to everyone and, and, and to our own hearts that, that we, we can get out of this, we, we can make this work. So the, the first notion is while we have this vision, we don't know exactly how we're going to fulfill every step. So let's make sure each step we take feels meaningful, meaningful feels like progress. There's some early wins that kind of pull us up right out of the, out of the bottom and start to feel some success. And, and we never forget to bring people along. We always want to hear their voice until they hear how they're connected to this and how they can help and be a part and be heard. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're not going to be engaged. They're not going to be psychologically engaged and committed in, in the process. And so that was one of the challenges over Zoom, right, is having people feel connected, feel heard during, during the early parts of, of, of the pandemic. But that's the initial advice. You know, let's let's not overreact. That's not a good choice. Let's really start to frame, right? Really frame this this new thing that we're moving to, which is absolute truth telling about where we're at, and absolute clarity about where we want to go. Amazing. So I guess what I'm really hearing you say is like that the first step is for them to get a vision so they actually know there is a way out of where they are and where they're feeling right now. Because I think this is the biggest thing for people is feelings are coming up that they've never felt before. And there aren't necessarily the processes or the frameworks or the way of being able to deal with it and move forward. So it's great that this is the work that you're doing to to support people on on their way from where they are to where they want to be. Yeah, and I think the one other element, Abigail, is is we always have to remind leaders we can get really stuck in in, in this larger strategy or larger vision, but it's got to be made real every day. We we call that notion everydayness. And so the reality check for leaders is is what's what's the intention today that's gonna make this 
this larger vision feel real to people, to feel real to, to, to ourselves that we're actually making, making progress. Uh, often under pressure, we, kinda, we can kind of disappear into the larger strategy, planning, making, but without that everydayness, the sense of progress, uh, having you know, a sense of purpose around what we're trying to do that day, everybody, right, to, to the degree we can, um, meaningful change is gonna, is gonna languish. Great, thank you, and thank you, Abigail, for the question. Um, flash remarks, you've got a question. I've got one in the uh, in the back channel here from Kurt, but uh, if you want to go next, please, on people on stage, to flash your mic so we know you're next. So, Paul, you'll, you'll be after this. Uh, but uh, before that, Mike, I want to ask you a question from Kurt Larson, who's, who's uh, in a noisy place. So uh, what is your recipe or tips to create an, uh, an uh, aha moment? So what is your recipe or tips to create an, an aha moment for this leadership? So You know, it's, it's um, the, to create the aha moment, I think one of the simple strategies is, is almost the conversation. You know, we've lost that art. Um, you know, we get caught in a screen driven world of texting and, and, but often the aha can come from kind of seeing things from a different perspective. So w- when we teach sense making, when we teach the second part of meaning, right, making sense out of things, what, what does this mean? You know, you know, what does this actually mean? Uh, we, we talk about small circles, which is, you know, l- little learning circles, which could start as simply as a conversation. So I'm starting to think about something. So I get on the f- phone and I call Hag-, Hag and I go, listen, here's, here's an idea I've been noodling. And with an openness, I said, what, 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 what are you thinking? And you start to share your experience, right? And then yeah. you know how that goes. Is then we, what, and then I'm kind of, tri- that triggers another thought for me and then one for you. And then the conversation kind of takes, uh, uh, takes on its own life. And I leave with some insight, right? Some aha that I didn't have. But often in this fast-paced world, we don't even have those kind of conversations. They, they feel messy. I feel like we don't have time, um, you know, and you don't get an aha through a text. You know, you have to do the messy work of of being being in the conversation. No, exactly, and um, and and it's kind of funny because I've I've got one client where you know I see them every six weeks because they're international, and then we have uh, one to three meetings a week, and. The, the funny thing is if the meeting's an hour or whether it's 90 minutes, all the aha moments tend to come at the end. <laughs> and, and I don't know, yeah. I'm not exactly sure why, because it's not even a time issue. If it's 90 minutes, it comes on 88 minute. So it's like an exciting football match. You know, it's all, it's all in the last 10 minutes. And uh, this has happened consistently for, for, for years. So I don't know if you can explain that for me. But uh, if you can, then they, they said that they'll only buy, you know, a quarter of my time and just, just buy the last 15 minutes on its own. Well, yeah, I think it speaks to the messiness of kind of, you know, dialogue, but it, it, it probably means people are fully present, they're, they're interested, they're passionate, um, often, right, because we always feel there's just not enough time because of the urgency of time. We spend most of our time kind of selling our own ideas, trying to promote. We want to get our ideas out on the table. So that's why it might also take some time before the aha emerges because, you know, we're, we're all trying to, you know, make sure that our ideas are, are being heard. But yeah, that, that capacity to really be in that back and forth dialogue as if we're sitting across from each other at a, in a coffee shop is elusive today. It's elusive today, again, because, hey, we only have 90 minutes for this meeting. And we've got to get all these objectives done. So um, I do believe we're, we're getting smarter in that respect. Uh, even though we have 12, 13 hours of screen time a day, I think people are finally realizing, too, that they've got to carve out, you know, those time, right, the time for those kind of real meaningful connections. So so while we're on that topic, and before I go to Paul, um, I think you're, you're slightly behind the UK in terms of getting face-to-face from a couple of things that you're saying. And, and so... In terms of the shift, um, how do you think it's it's going to kind of fall? To, in in terms of, you know, how much can you really do virtually, and how much will go back to traditional? I need to talk to you face to face. I know, back to the aha moments again. A lot of those things happen after hours when you're having dinner and stuff. People are relaxed to bring out the crazy ideas, right? And and there's 
there's a freedom to follow some some weird thoughts through in terms of acquiring a business or or changing a product line, which again, when you're under the 30 minute, one hour scrutiny of a meeting, you're like, well, I'm not gonna bring this up now. So uh, what's exactly. your feeling in terms of how it's gonna go back the balance to kind of virtual and face-to-face? It, it, it's not gonna happen, uh, you know, left to our own devices, you know, there's a much stronger instinct, right, for us to preserve and our status and to survive and get through and, Get, you know, get through the day. So it does take leadership, it takes personal leadership. It's not just the, the, you know, the hierarchical leadership that we're used to, but it's it's leadership from people who will start to make a commitment. No, no, no we're going to we're going to protect time. Uh, we're going to our, our meeting meetings are going to have a different centering because we know if we if we're not connecting, uh, you know, this is we're not going to be able to create that those shared meetings, meetings and that shared vision that will just allow us to really accelerate our efforts. So I, I think without without the leadership, without that you know the that that uh, that commitment to making the work human centered. Um, while that sounds nice, you know we all know deep deep down without it, you know it, you know we're just not going to get that kind of you know commitment engagement sh- shared focus that is needed today, given all the complexity that we're up against. Great, thanks, Mike. Uh, Paul, thanks for being patient. Over to you for either a comment or a question. Yeah, I've got a, hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, I've got a question slightly off the pandemic topic, uh, but but more around change. Um, And this mostly in my experience has incurred when you have a new CEO or a new leader in a division, and they want to take the, the entity in a different direction. Um, And in my experience, there's always one or two folks who really uh, do not want to go in that direction. For whatever reason, they believe it's the wrong direction. Uh, They they feel aggrieved because perhaps they think they should be the head of the division or whatever. Um, And just would love to get your thoughts on the things that you would do to try and keep those folks to get engaged. Because often if they run an important part of the company and they have their own teams that are loyal to them, you, you have real challenges where you don't want to lose them, or at least you want to lose them gracefully so that they don't take half the company with them. Um, so in your experience, I don't know if you've had situations like that and, and how you would advise us to, to better handle them. Yeah, great, great question, right? With with any change, right, you, there's going to be barriers and challenges. And for big changes like that, where a CEO, uh, a senior leader says, we're, we're, we need to go in a new direction and I'm going to drive this. And, and sometimes they're brought in, you know, with, with, with that intent. So when I've done, done one-on-one coaching, what's critical at the beginning is that stakeholder analysis, you know, and, and you write down the names, you know, you, it's who, who, who's in, who's not. And if they're, and if they're not, what, what is our strategy? How are we going to bring them under the tent, make sure that they're not outside the tent as we, as, as we move forward. And as you know, not everybody always makes the journey. You know, the, the new vision may be misaligned to, you know, just too misaligned to, to, to who they are and what, what, what they think the organization would be achieving. But you want, it, you want it, that to come out early on. You don't want that to bite you, you know, halfway through a process where now things are getting critical. So that stakeholder analysis where you write every name down, you know, and you get a sense of the end. How do I need to communicate with them? Is it daily? What kind of communication is needed? Uh, Is this a prayer meeting where we really need to put our cards on the table? So no big change really, really gets to initiate without really having a sense that that who's at the table, who's critical and um, how we're going to work with them. And so, sorry, just quick follow on. Um, one of my experiences, and again, just love to get your comment on this, was um, we did a bunch of outreach, we did a bunch of efforts at change, and we kind of knew there were two people that that were really not joining the direction. And then the, the CEO had this meeting, brought everybody in, and, and the, the pre-engagement had taken place, and, and came out with this statement. He's like, we're going in this direction, you're either on the bus or you're not on the bus. And it was pretty much a challenge to the group um, you know, if you're not going to move in the way that we have to move, then you need to recognize that you need to go somewhere else. 
I remember being slightly shocked that that statement came out because it was very much, you know, we were probably going to lose a couple of good people. Would you recommend that at some point in the process? You, you said don't let it run too long. At some point, do you just call it? And, and then at least you know what the reality is that you're dealing with. What would be your advice or thoughts on that? Yeah, that's again another great uh, another great question. It's it, and that's the you know the judgment call. There's no there's no uh, formula for that, but there's this sense of of uh, uh, you know ha- has there been this process that has really engaged people so they absolutely see the from two that's emerged that here, here's our current position. It's it, it, you know we can't stay here. Here's our 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 vision, right? Here's where we want to go. Here's why it makes sense. Makes sense to me. Because remember, everybody's asking three questions, right, in their mind. You know, what does this mean to me? And as you're noting, there's probably a couple of people where uh, I don't know if I buy in uh, that this strategy makes sense. Doesn't make sense to me. Or it might be more around purpose. This doesn't align to who I am. I've been here with this company for, for years. And where it's going doesn't feel purposeful, doesn't feel right to me. And then the third thing, what does it mean to me personally? Hey, I, I have less of a role. I have less influence now. People are going to see that in this new direction. I'm, I'm less on board. So I always, with CEOs, you know, want to encourage. You, you, you really want to feel like, you know, we gave everyone every chance to get on the bus, to be aligned, to have those kind of discussions, to to see if they can align around those three questions. And if they can't, yeah, you have to give that speech. At some point, it's like the bus is leaving. Um, everyone's had a chance to really, you know, participate in this process. But but here, here here's where we're going. And sometimes that can, uh, you know, t- take things to the point where, where some of those people will actually rethink, you know, because now they're, in a kind of a different survival mode. They're about ready to, to be called on it. It might help them to rethink, well, maybe this is the right vision. And I just got stuck in my own, you know, kind of my own selfish focus on this. But yeah, at some point after feeling, it's that, it's that, it's that uh, thing you always say with CEOs, you know, you want to get to the point where you feel like you can sleep at night with that decision. And if you can, then go for it. Great, thanks. Yeah, I like that, Mike. And you, you also make me think that I think in, in many of the uh, the transformations that my company's been involved in, people don't often believe that the transformation is really going to occur or the executives are behind it. So uh, taking that approach about the the bus leaving is one where they, they really get that it is going to happen this time because maybe, again, for years they've been told there's going to be some level of transformation or change and they don't believe the executives are going to see it through or they're going to fund it. And, and so I think uh, in some cases it's good. But 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 I think uh, I'm also going to, if you've got any comments on that, Mike, go ahead. And after that, I think Abigail's also going to comment on the side conversation we're having again about, uh, you know, get on the bus or get off. And I know as a kid I used to hitchhike. So, again, once you get the option, like you say, Mike, that if you don't get on the bus you're going to have to hitchhike, then you might rethink your position and say, well, you know what? This bus isn't that bad after all. But uh, so, so I'm going to ask Abigail just to to give another question that we had. Yeah. So, just really building on what Paul was saying there about the whole getting on the bus and not being on the bus, I was interested. Um, obviously, Mike, you mentioned at the start, we're in the great resignation period of time at the moment, where um, organisations are struggling to get great talent. Great talent is uh, questioning the organisations that they're working for. So, reading uh, a piece of news around the whole Elon Musk's stance in all of this that. We, we want you to come back to the office, come back to the office or else. Um, just it sort of reminds me of this whole we're, get on the bus or, or not. Where, where or what are your thoughts around this whole conversation and how leaders can actually get their organisations to be as creative and, and innovative as perhaps they were when people are in person versus the need to perhaps now work hybrid because it really does work from a productivity point of view better. So I guess my question is really just to get your thoughts around it, not necessarily go down the confrontational rabbit hole of uh, specifically what Elon Musk said. But yeah, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, that yeah, good, good question. And I've seen I've seen uh, organizations kind of make 
a mistake in this area because here we, you know, we 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 go offline, right, for for two years in response. We we develop new routines and rituals, and and uh, and some of them are good. Some of them really do represent a maybe a better new way of working. And so I've seen some CEOs get ahead of get ahead of the game and and instead of really involving their team and what what did we learn and what do we want to keep and retain and 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 what do we need to do in terms of being able to build those more personal connections that that we also uh, think are necessary so yeah i always kind of you know shudder a little bit when i see those headlines not knowing for sure how how much uh you know participation there was in the in the in the in developing, doing the sense making around it, uh, but if you think of the the meaningful change, if you just say everybody's got to be back, that's it. There's no flexibility, you know, come back or else. Uh, you know, that's going to disengage a lot of people. They'll come back, but you you just missed an opportunity to to after two years of learning deeply how we best work and what might be the right balance. To throw all that out and not really leverage it is a mistake. And remember, right, when when someone makes that claim, everybody's coming back, everybody asks those questions. What does this mean to me? What does this mean to me? And 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 part of it's the sense making, you know, do I have to get daycare or you know, do you have to be on the road another hour now a day? Uh, so they do some sense making for it, but then they also there's that purpose question, is this really this kind of organization, this kind of leadership, really aligned to, to who I am, and and w- do I have other options in that case? What does this really mean mean to me? So uh, if we're not if we're blowing past the meaning part, if we're not taking time to allow people to do the sense making and to, and for us as an organization to create more of a shared view of what would be the right thing. Um, yeah, you'll get people back to work, not all of them, but the ones who do come back to work, you may not get all, you know, their whole, their whole psychological engagement. Yeah, I love that. Great, great answer. And I think the whole asking the questions is really, really important as well, because the more questions we ask, and the more we explore things, the the better able we are as organizations, and individuals to come up with the next steps. I loved how you address that. I'm, I'm also just looking at the, um, you know, the the ability for for leadership, and this is a question that's in the back channel from Sarah, but, but and I'm just changing the question slightly because I think what you've just said now it it also implies that you need a leadership team that can can balance the virtual to, you know, the virtual that's a lot more empowering with with people doing work from home to the office working, and so. What if you've, you know, if you've got a, a leadership team that's not really trained in in the virtual? Um, do you know what I mean? In terms of because I mean, and I'm not saying Elon Musk, but but, but what if you did have a team of 20, 30 leaders who you know aren't going to be able to to do it remotely? So so again, it, it's not just a question of I need my people back. It's a question of I need to retool my team to be able to work with people virtually or get you know empower them, and, and so. And I know Gary Hamill's got a book, you know, a little about that, which is, uh, you know, running, running your organization with, you know, hundreds of micro organizations approach where everyone's empowered uh, and, you know, zero distance from the customer. So, so again, what if you don't have that? So, so the question is really around uh, the leadership style that you need to, 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 to handle the mix of virtual working and office working. Yeah. And the, yeah, that's a good question. I, and I think, all these questions, that's why the, the, you know, framing the meaningful change, there's, there's always going to be this tensions between things, right? You know, uh, being at work versus being at home, being virtual versus being in the room. Uh, you know, there's always going to be this tension. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing because it makes us really think about what, what, what might work best. What did we actually learn in these last two years that we can start to test even a little bit further? So what I would always love to see is that, you know, it's whatever the tension is, the virtual versus non-virtual, is, is that exploration, not just talking about it, but run, running little experiments. Well, let's, let's try this for a bit. You know, not forever, but for, for a month or, or two months. Let's get more experience with it. You know, it's not going to cost us anything. 
but when you have that kind of engaging environment where people are learning their way, right? In fact, when they, whenever they've done studies where they've asked people to solve problems, when they throw in this little quip where they just say, uh, solve the problem, but learn as much as you can, something interesting happens. Uh, it doesn't take any more time to solve the problem, but they often serve, solve it in a more novel way. Something triggers in the brain where we ask people to not just do something, not just do something, uh, get it off the list, get it, get it handled, but to see what they can learn along the way. Now, that's not yeah. every challenge, right? But, but I think, yeah, we're, we're part of creating meaningful change is being able to, to know that whenever any change is involved, people are asking those, those three questions. They have to make sense out of it. They have to see, does it align to, to, to our purpose? And then what, is it, what does it ultimately mean, mean, mean for me? And the trick is, is, is involve them in it. Once you involve them in it, uh, you know, the, the, they have to be part of the leadership. They have to be part of the, uh, you know, making things more, you know, ma- making them work. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a great conversation, and I want to take what you've said now and just uh, coming up to our final question, I guess, um, before we wrap it on the on the hour. But uh, what you're saying kind of connects into failure at some point and the acceptance of failure. And I think um, what's been intriguing for me, and it could be the corporate university background uh, that you've had, but uh, the, I'm, I'm intrigued that you use the word learning so much. And I really kind of, uh, I guess, I really enjoyed hearing that. And I think. Learning also drives acceptance of failure. The you know the ability to to pilot something or or experiment, not just get the result, but actually learn in the process. And I guess with all this new uh, sets of data available through AI and machine learning, you know, learning is 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 top of the of the list of things you want one of your leaders to do. I guess because um, it's not just transactional anymore. But, but I just wanted to know what your your feeling was around again, you know, failure, and how that that kind of correlates to uh, to meaningful change. Yeah, good good question. It's it's I, I do think part of of framing this around meaningful change, looking for the meaning, is because the world is tougher. Our lives are tough. Our lives are challenging. Even people who seem to have it going well, believe me, they're they're carrying carrying some some burden, some challenge, but. We're in a state where we almost have to frame it that way, that, hey, you know, this is, you know, our time together is going to be filled with challenge. And 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 we know that we're not going to we're, we're going to lean into it and it's going to build our help build our relationships and, and it's going to help us in our problem solving. And if you think of think of that, most of the in organizations, the ethos is is the opposite of that. We, we don't want to we don't want to frame things as too challenging. We want people to be happy and we want to, you know, get home on time and, you know, and everybody gets, gets promoted and gets recognized. But we, we kind of can, can, can kind of sway things more to the happiness end of the quotient. But I think when we, when we frame things as, as challenging, it kind of gives us that, you know, the, the sense that it's not always about failure, but it's going to be tough to get some of these gains. And when we don't get them right away, or there is that occasional failure, uh, it's only going to make us better in the long run. This is what we signed up for. You know, we signed up for this challenging assignment. And and at the end of the day, at the end of the day, we wouldn't want to be anywhere else. You know, we love this challenge. We love the fact that we're all in and we play like we're all in. You know, we're going to do whatever we can to, to, to get this win. But it's rare you find organizations that have that, you know, that... Uh, kind of commitment to seeing that way you know they yeah. we tend to not uh you know uh really focus on 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 the you know the, the real current reality yeah it's a kind of magic and i think um it's exactly what people need today as they uh it's the age of uncertainty right so so i think again anybody who's going to feel uncomfortable and that affects their the decision making it's it's not going to be easy so i think the way to look at like you say is if if i go into to a sports you know a sports um day and i'm in the swimming heats then again i've got to enjoy the challenge rather than take the stress right i mean that's the thing and as you say i think it's more and more important today uh, with everything going on 
So, so I think there's some amazing information here we can extract from this conversation, Mike. Really been a pleasure. I don't think we've sat down and talked like this since uh, probably, well, we had a lovely dinner with our, our, our buddy, but uh, been at least 20 years since we've been in one of those conference rooms banging stuff out for eight hours a day. Um, so again, it's a wonderful pleasure. We're, we're going to be extracting some of the real uh, kind of key points and uh, and good luck with your, your book. Um, hopefully we'll have you back once you get your book out. It's been an absolute pleasure again to talk to you. And the, uh, the, the whole core topic of leadership and creating meaningful change, I think it's really, really uh, playing in my mind some of the concepts that you've said. I think there's some really interesting things there. And as people can see on the top of uh, well, the ones who can see their, their phone on Clubhouse, um, there's the uh, link to my other side of the business card, which is on not only Apple Podcasts, but on all the platforms. So again, jump in and listen to some of uh, the leaders there talking about mindset and some of them actually reflecting some of the things you've said, Mike. So um, again, being a great pleasure. Thanks to all my business winners. And like I said, uh, you can go online with Instagram, LinkedIn, and, and you'll see an updates from this and other sessions we've had. And uh, back to you, Mike. Again, a really, really big thank you. Um, hope it's time for your breakfast now and a good cup of coffee uh, out in Los Angeles. Yes, it is. Thank you, Hank. Yeah, and thanks to everyone for participating. Uh, uh, have a great uh, great rest of the week. Okay, and I look forward to maybe uh, catching up with you when I'm in Los Angeles in the summer. Beautiful. See you, Mike. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to this session of Hague's Business Winners Club. Hit the subscribe button to stay updated with all the latest insightful business conversations from industry experts, leaders, and entrepreneurs.